Okay, so you have me. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this class and for staying together with our course. Um, if you want, uh, we'll be using Kahoot again today, so feel free to register for this game. I'll bring this number up when the first question comes. And uh, today we are, so over the past few days, we spent two days talking about the basics of gravitational lensing, the history, how we found the first lens, how we came up with the idea, how we slowly build up larger and larger samples, and how we do observations ranging from radio observations all the way to optical and beyond. Um, we derived a lot of theory, uh, how we can get the image positions for starting from a point mass lens to something like real galaxies. And yesterday I did a wide overview of all the science we've been doing with uh, strong lensing, from learning about the lensing galaxies to uh, finding very distant objects to resolving high redshift galaxies and studying them in uh, amazing detail. But all of this uh, wouldn't be possible if we actually didn't know where to point our telescopes. And so, okay, where is this going? And so today's lecture, um, today's lecture will be about as will be about how do we find gravitational lenses, and especially the strong gravitational lenses. Um, to put this in a more um, practical perspective, if you're an astronomer and you want to produce some of these amazing images we were showing, we, were, uh, we saw over the past few days, done with Hubble Space Telescopes or ALMA or Global VLBI, you need to know where to point these telescopes. So these telescopes provide extremely high resolution, but the field of view, the portion of the sky that see at any given instant, is really small. So you need to know where to po point them exactly. And crucially, there's the so-called allocation committee. So it's not that you come to Hubble Telescope and say, I want to observe that, or you, say, or you come to them and say, say, observe this. There is a process very write up what you want to observe, come up with a few page proposal, submit it to a committee, and then the chances of you getting the observing time are easily one to six, one to 10. Um, so we, so for all of this, we need, to, we need to know how to find gravitational lenses to tell the telescopes where to point them, and maybe, to, maybe we need a way how to select the most interesting of these gravitational lenses. Um, so, I'll just start by letting you guess. And the um, uh, question that I'll ask you is how many that you should guess is how many gravitational lens, strong gravitational lenses do we know so far? I've been a bit repetitive in my slides over the last few days, um, showing the, sim the same sample of lenses over and over. Uh, but now it should be the uh, Kahoot time, so if everyone could join in, I'll give you a bit more time. Um, and you can start thinking. So the question is, how many gravitation, strong gravitational lenses do you think we know at the moment? So three to 100. I didn't know, I, I option less than three because we definitely saw more than three gravitational lenses during these classes. 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000, more than 1,000. Oh, cool, that was, that was fast. Um, here. Uh, unless, unless I, so we are discovering more of them on weekly to monthly basis, but so far we know may, maximum 500 strong lenses. Um, I checked the statistics yesterday, and of the lensed quasars, the nice images with two, the nice lenses with two or four images, we found around 200 of them. In uh, 50, in uh, 40 years since the discovery of the first lens, which is not uh, that much, uh, survey I'll talk about a bit later. 
um, are actually a large portion of all the lenses we know so far. Um, so lenses are actually very, very rare uh, because you need, to ha you need typically a very massive galaxy in front and very massive ellipticals are rare and you need to have a perfect alignment with the, the, with the source in the background which is also extremely rare. And then there are some very special things uh, out there such as uh, this one, okay, that looks much better on my screen. But you see a massive galaxy in the center, you see a ring of stars. And if you would, uh, wouldn't mind going back to Kahoot again, take your time. Okay, now you see the ring a bit better. What is this? Ooh. If this was a real lens, you would have seen it 20 times over the last uh, few days, because I, I wouldn't stop showing it. Uh, this is what we call a ring galaxy. Now, this is the mo a very extreme case. What is happening here, there is a also a population in the center, and there is a ring of young, young stars around it. And this looks, this is, looks extreme. But there's actually many of them. Here is another example. This is the pinwheel galaxy. The label fell out of the window. So here, here you see something that you would think is maybe a spiral galaxy over here. But there is actually these massive rings of, ring of, stars, ring of stars around it. And it really looks like a gravitational lens, especially the uh, previous one. Except when you would think of it very um, well, at this quality, you can't necessarily see that. But the ring never repeats itself. It's, it doesn't have this multiple image configuration that you would expect. And if you would take spectra of this part and this part, you would find if they um, are at the same redshift. Same with this galaxy. Now you can see some streaks of stars between the center and the ring. And uh, you might ask, how are these galaxies formed? They typically formed during interaction with another galaxy. Uh, so actually, ring, if you have this dynamical interaction, you can have a ring-like uh, resonance. This is basically, uh, well, as you have in the solar system with moons or, um, or some exoplanets, so basically these stars fell into a resonance. Um, and this is just an effect by uh, this galaxy interacting with some other galaxy, and I forgot to check whether it is any of these two or whether it's something else. So not only there are a few gravitational lenses, there is a lot of things that look really like a lens, but are not. Um, that was the quiz time. Um, so what I will talk to today is, uh, in not necessarily this order, I'll talk about lens fighting techniques in general. I'll say how we can do this with spectroscopy when we have detailed spectra of each galaxy and what do we do when we, can, when we only rely on um, pictures taken with, with different color filters. I'll talk how we get smart and try to select lenses. I'll uh, give a detailed overview of two, um, to uh, big surveys that were trying to find lenses. Uh, there will be class and slacks. Uh, these surveys, what they do, they only provide you some candidates, something that might be a gravitational lens. So you need to follow it, follow it up and confirm. And uh, final talk, what I already hinted at um, earlier, about the amazing number of lenses that are, will be coming in f within the next uh, few years and decades. Um, just to put this in, in the numbers, um, strong lenses is, is indeed extremely rare. I didn't do the full calculation here. Oh, I lost the tank. Um, to make sure that you have a strong gravitational lens, you ideally want to have two images, at least, of the background galaxy. Because if you, have a, if you are in the direction where you have only one image of a background source, it's really difficult for you to see whether there is lensing going on or not. So you need more than, you need two or four or three or four images and maybe Einstein ring. 
And if you do the math, the chances of a high redshift source being glanced are maybe one to 10,000, which is not crazy low, but it's very low. Imagine you would have to look at 10,000 galaxies to find one gravitational lens. So how did we find many of the, of the lenses uh, that we know now? Uh, by chance. Uh, if you remember the Q0957, the first gravitational lens discovered that, we, uh, that I talked about on the first day, what they were doing, they were targeting um, radio bright quasars. So they were looking for AGNs at large distances. And they were, so these were, they were doing this by radio, and then they used optical spectroscopy to try to put the redshift onto these galaxies. And just by chance, they were using high-resolution telescope they were able to see that one of, these two one of these two quasars has two components. And then they used the spectroscopy to confirm that indeed these two images over here have a very similar spectra. And when, um, so this was the original images they were working with. If you go much deeper in exposure, you will see there's actually a lot of galaxies that you can't see in this image because the quasars are so uh, ridiculously bright. But if you go, if you integrate for a long time, you will reveal there is a lot of galaxies that actually act as gravitational lenses. And uh, to demonstrate that this is indeed much longer exposure, look at the star over here. It's bleeding only a little bit, but now it's horribly oversaturated because we just integrated for so long. Um, the lens we have been seeing a lot um, this week was the RxJ1131. And so how was it discovered? And again, by chance. Uh, the team by Dominic Sluse were doing polarimetric imaging. So they were looking at the um, two polarizations of starlight, of uh, not starlight, of light from the quasar to learn something about its properties. And again, they were using two pretty high resolution telescopes to do this. And when they did it, they suddenly realized that the images looked like this. And so when they did some uh, subtraction of the light, they found, okay, you can't see that there are three bright images. And crucially, here again, you don't see the lens in galaxy. You see this big blob over here, some small blob over here. So you have to model them and subtract. And then you find, oh, yeah, there is a lens in galaxy in the middle. And when you do the spectroscopy, uh, because again, you could have something like we saw before, a ring-like galaxy or just a bunch of galaxies together, although that is unlikely with quasars. Uh, here is a spectrum for the image that is over here. Here is the spectrum, the A1, for the brightest of the three images over here. And here is a spectrum for the galaxy in the center. And you will find you know, these two, the D and these three images have very similar spectra. There is a bright emission line over here, some bright emission lines over here. They're, they align very nicely. And this is the spectrum of the central galaxy, which looks completely different. And if you take some of these emission, uh, some of these absorption lines, does it have a strong emission? It, it has a strong emission here. You would see that, it that it's a very different redshift. This is a redshift of 0.66. This is a, a redshift of, of uh, around 0.2. So now they found that there are four images with a similar redshift and a galaxy in the center at a very different redshift that's like a gravitational lens. Um, but hoping that we will get lucky does not really work if you want to really do science and especially build large samples of galaxies. Uh, so people have been trying to find lenses using different ideas. You can try to use the morphology, because if you have multiple images or Einstein arcs, that might be reasonably, um, uh, that might, you might be easy, able to spot that and try to select lenses that way. You can do spectroscopy, because as we saw in the slide uh, before, we have now two galaxies, the lensing galaxy and the lens source, that are very close together spatially but have very different spectra. So if you, if, you, if you would take the spectra of this entire region, you would actually see emission lines and absorption lines for two very different redshifts. 
Um, you can go for unusually bright sources because of the high lensing magnifications. You can tr tr make a bet that if you see something really bright, it might be a gravitational lens or a nearby galaxy. I mean, but nearby galaxies you, you usually can find. And uh, this gets even worse for large samples. Um, the old school way is to do it by eye. Um, fun fact, it's still the best way in many ways. And I'll explain it later. Uh, so you need a lot of uh, students for that or, or some really crazy people. And I will discuss that later. Uh, there have been some citizen science projects that I will discuss. Um, people are trying to use machine learning. And I think MJ is an expert on that next week. So how we can make finding lenses easier? We can go for high redshift sources. So the further away from you your, the source is, the more likely that the light as it comes towards you will encounter a very massive galaxy. So if you look at sources at redshift 0.5, none of them will be lensed. At redshift 1, it's going to, to pick up. At redshift 4, actually you might have a better chance of finding something that's gravitationally lensed. We need high resolution, because if you can't tell apart the Einstein arcs or multiple images uh, from the lensing galaxy, you'll never find that you have a gravitational lens, unless you have the spectroscopy. And another major thing is that uh, I, I was hinting at yesterday. So yesterday when I was talking about how many degrees of freedom we have for lens modeling, um, I said that relying on fluxes of the lensed images might be tricky. And the problem is that the foreground galaxy has dust in it. And so this can dim your, um, your images. Um, you also need to go be, uh, think a bit at what wavelength they want to do the observations. So here is one uh, nice, well, nice gravitational lens. You, in this image, you might sort of see the multiple there is an arc here, there are multiple images here, and this is, it's a complicated lens, so there is more lensed images in the radio. Uh, so in the radio, it's clear, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Here you see there is a, this is near infrared. You see there is some complicated structure here. This is normal optical light, and it's completely dominated by young stars in the foreground galaxies. You can't, you will never see there's a gravitational lens just from this image. Here you can maybe spot it. Here you can definitely see there's something interesting going on, like what is this, like uh, seven quasars uh, suddenly close together. So I tried to draw a very brief and uh, rough scheme of how do we do it. Um, so you need to have a starting sample, so you either piggyback, you either use some already existing surveys and try to select your candidates using some fancy technique. So this is what we typically do in optical and radio wavelengths. Or you can do, you can just go for a large area of sky and hope to find some very bright sources, which is what we do at far infrared. Then you somehow select the candidates, and I'll talk, now, talk later how do we do it. Uh, in far infrared millimeter waves, typically the brightest stuff is lensed. Here, it gets more tricky. And then you want to make sure that you actually have a gravitational lens. So you need high resolution observations to see there are indeed multiple images or Einstein arcs. And you need the follow-up spectroscopy to make sure that the, the two sources are the, the two things are two different redshifts. Otherwise, you have ring galaxies all over the place. And maybe after this filtering, maybe you have some lenses left. And if you wouldn't mind going back to the Kahoot. Oh, there we go. So I'll think about the, think about how, which wavelengths we used to find lenses. Which of them is not good for finding gravitational lenses? Radio, millimeter wave, x-rays, or optical? Very good. So 
I'll, I'll just clarify. So as we, you probably saw enough optical lenses to know that we can um, definitely find lenses in the optical wavelengths. In radio, we can do it, and I'll discuss um, in a few minutes how uh, does the selection work in the radio. And indeed, X-rays are the one wavelength where um, doing lensing is very difficult, or basically hasn't been done. Uh, the problem for X-rays is that the resolution is typically very, very low. And also, um, there is not, it's hard to, so with radio, for example, you can select AGNs at high redshift. With optical, you can maybe select quasars. In X-rays, there is a lot of confusion between nearby and high redshift sources. High redshift sources might be often very dim. Um, so X-rays are is actually very difficult. And I'll try to find the next question. What color, if you think about looking at optical wavelength, what color is your typical gravitational lens? Both the foreground galaxy and the, and the lens source. And here is RFJ1131. In one filter, so you can't see the difference in colors from it. So is the lensing galaxy red, background blue? Lensing galaxy is red, and the background galaxy is also red. Lensing galaxy is blue, and the background galaxy is also blue. Or lensing galaxy is blue, and the background galaxy is red. Very good. Lensing galaxy, so as we said before, lensing galaxies, are you need something very massive, typically an elliptical galaxy. And elliptical galaxies have very little star formation going on. They have very few young stars, but a lot of old stars. So they are typically redder. But also, elliptical galaxies are rare. So whereas blue star forming galaxies, there's plenty of them, especially as you go back towards high redshift. And I'll uh, towards higher redshift. So elliptical galaxies will do mostly the lensing. So the lenses will be preferentially red. But then what color your source is going to have depends a bit, depends strongly on what is the relative number of blue and red galaxies at high redshift. And the blue galaxies then. And indeed, there is this uh, nice plot I only found last night uh, from a recent paper. Uh, where they look at this, so this is a comparison uh, that shows the color of the of the source galaxy. Uh, this is and this is the color of the lensing galaxy. Uh, this is in magnitudes. So this is uh, green minus red. Um, so I believe blue is over here. Okay, and uh, red is over here. No? No. The other way around. Basically, the point is, if the galaxies have the same color, it would be along this line. Up here, it means the galaxy, the lensing galaxy is bluer than the source, and it happens only in 2% of the cases. And down here means that the lensing galaxy is redder than the source. And this already gives you a hint of how we can try to deal, deal with this. There will be two distinct colors for the lensing galaxy and the lens source, and uh, the images and the, len the lens will be in the center. Well, just like in a ring galaxy, actually, this is redder than the blue thing around here, so we don't get rid of them. So if you compare the galaxy over here and the cosmic horseshoe, which is definitely a lens, multiple images, um, we need we can select them by color, but then we need to think about morphology. Does it have multiple images? And crucially, the redshifts are necessary. Um, because for this galaxy, the redshift coming from the redshift of this red part and the redshift of this blue part is going to be very different because they are large distance from each other. Whereas here, it's the same galaxy. They all have the same redshift. And so, um, that's what I was trying to do. Um, so this is, again, one of the options. Even if you don't have resolved images, you can just look for redshifts of the lens and source 
with the unresolved observations, but I'll talk about it later. Right now, I'll talk about radio, searching for galaxies at radio wavelengths. So if you go back in history, you see that the first strong gravitational lens, and indeed many of the first gravitational lenses found, were detected at the radio wavelengths. And the reason for that is that at, in, optical, in optical, the sky is full of galaxies, and they are all, they, they can be quite bright. At radio wavelengths, this gets a bit simpler. There are a few very strong radio sources. There is the sun. There are stars in our galaxy. There is AGNs, and there is all the stuff that we call interference. But we can filter this easily. We know where the sun is. Stars, pretty much the same. Uh, satellites, microwave, electric fences. Uh, we can go to a rem remote site. We can put our radio telescope far from civilization and into a desert so there are no cows around. And we can use some filtering because we normally know where do, how do these signals look like. And active galactic nuclei, the, the, other, the last type of source, is a really good because they remain, they are extremely bright and so you can see them until very high redshift. And this is already, going back to what I was saying before, if you have a very high redshift source, it has a somewhat higher chance that as the light was traveling towards you, it passed around a massive galaxy and got banned. So we can just blindly follow up all bright radio sources, uh, which, will, which has been done, so I'll show that in a second. Uh, but the problem is that uh, if you just blindly follow bright radio sources, you'll find f things like this. So radio loud AGNs, the signal comes from the, center, the central AGN and these massive radio lobes. Here they are, the color indicates the strength of the signal. And the problem is if you have low resolution data, one image, another image, same redshift, and if you don't see the foreground galaxy, this looks very much like a double imaged lens. Especially because this can be linear, so it, they seem to be very nicely aligned. And indeed, if you would look at some non-lens radio sources, they look like this. Or like this, and I mean, when I saw this, I was like, ooh, that, that, uh, that, that would, I, would, I might get confused by this. So what we can try to do is to use, is to weed them out a bit. And you can observe it two radio wavelengths, and then you can um, use an interesting properties of that. So if I will go back uh, to this image, so there is the central core over here. Which, which can be also very bright. There are these two bright radio lobes. We don't care about radio, these radio lobes. There are contaminants. But this is a very compact source that can be lensed and form uh, reliable multiple images. So what you would like to be able to do is to differentiate between radio emission that comes from something very small and radio emission that can come from something that comes in doubles. And you can do it by using the spectral index. And all this, what the spectral index means is uh, um, now I'll get burned again. Um, is if you have your frequency here, here is your intensity of the signal, and you observe at two different your source at your two radio frequencies. It can have different spectra. It can have a spectrum that's ramping up that's constant or that's going down. And so we call this slope spectral index. And the spectral index of the radio lobes is much lower. This goes to, down to minus, here it's minus two, here it's around minus one, than the one in the center of the source because the physical processes and the obscuration are different. So if we could find, if, if we focus on the sources that have very shallow spectral index, um, we might be, we will filter out all these contaminants. And so now we'll talk about a big survey of lenses uh, done with a very large array in New Mexico uh, called the Cosmic Lens All Sky Survey, uh, or CLASS. Um, I'll just clarify. 
it's not an all sky survey because VLA doesn't see some part of the sky because it's on the ground, but it covered all the sky they could see from the VLA uh, site in New Mexico. Uh, they took all the bright radio sources that were known at the time. And they applied a cut in the spectral index. So from the catalogs, they discarded everything that had spectral index too low. So they, their spectral index is higher than op minus 0.5. And they chose bright sources. Because bright sources, because if you have a bright source, it might be because it's lensed. And if you apply these two criteria, you are left with 16,500 objects. Uh, and this is coming from catalogs that done at low resolution, so you don't know if these have multiple images or not. What they did then is they went to the VLA and put in a very large program that they would take snapshot observations of all these objects with VLA at somewhat higher frequency and at very high resolution, 0.2 arc seconds. So we saw yesterday or the previous days that a typical Einstein ring might be an arc second or so. This would really resolve it. And uh, then they looked for sources that indeed have multiple components within less than six arc seconds within each other. And they found 149 candidates after this selection. And if they relax their criteria, they have 194 additional sources. How was this done? By hand. Um, so they used what you were laughing about before. For all the 16,000 images done with the VLA, they had multiple people going through them and trying to look for something that looked like a multiple image configuration. And then they used also some automatic model. Uh, this is again early 2000s to um, to try to do this uh, in a more sophisticated way. So you have a lot of a few hundred candidates. What do you do then? Did the slide not change? Okay. Uh, you go for even higher resolution. And they went to e Merlin, and then to even higher resolution. At, at the end, oh, sorry, they had 22 lenses out of, it, this should be 16,000 objects they started with. And just to explain, so this is how the VLA images look like of some of the lenses. So there is uh, maybe something happening here, two images over here. Oh, this has four images. Two images, two images, two images, two images, two images, two images, two images uh, second, faint second image. I believe I have more of this. So again, you see some, this is actually three images. Um, this, this is three images, this is uh, a bit of a mess. There are something interesting happening here. Uh, this actually has an Einstein ring, if you would look at it at high resolution. So this is the pipeline they were using. And uh, so these are the images from the VLA. Then they went, as I said, they went to e Merlin. Uh, that we mentioned on the first day, e Merlin is an uh, interferometer in the UK, made up from different radio dishes, so you can see uh, seven of the dishes from the array. They are at different sites. Each dish is different, which makes uh, fun to process the data. And as a fun fact, they have the first huge radio dish built, the Lowell Telescope in, uh, outside of Manchester. This was built in 1950s, among other things, using, spare, using parts that were previously in uh, British battleships. They were going for, to scrap so they could get um, parts for them, uh, from them for cheap. And uh, when you do, so these are the VLA images, when you go to Merlin, you get much higher resolution. And now you can see, you start resolving these two images away. You see there is an Einstein ring over here. Three images over here, lots of images over here. Um, so this is one way how you can do it. Go to radio wavelengths and sacrifice a lot of observing time. Remember, they observed 16,000 galaxies to find 22 lenses. The problem with this type of selection is that actually most galaxies in the universe don't have an AGN. So what you are doing here, you are selecting something that's radio bright, has an AGN. This galaxy doesn't. 
and indeed a lot of galaxies won't have uh, radio loud AGNs. Even RxJ1131, which is a quasar, so it actually has an active galactic nucleus, which is very luminous in optical wavelengths. In radio wavelengths, it's quite, it's, uh, it's more faint. So the other approach I was hinting at before is uh, we can try to skip uh, some steps here. Because what was done here, they found all the galaxies and they were still using spectroscopy to get the redshift of the lens and the background quasar. You can skip that step completely and just do lens finding but using spectroscopy. And this is indeed how the first strong lens that wasn't an uh, AGN and made an Einstein ring was discovered. So it was a paper by Varen in, uh, in 1996 where they were doing spectroscopy of 150 early time, which means elliptical galaxies for other science purposes. And then in one of the spectra, they found, so they have, you have this feature lens old sterile spectra with some breaks here. This is a, like a low redshift elliptical galaxy. And then they suddenly found this massive emission line which shouldn't come from an elliptic galaxy. It's a line from a star from a galaxy at redshift beyond two. So they realized that within very small radius, they had two galaxies that seem to be very closely aligned. And indeed, when you go to high resolution images, this is 1996, okay, you would see there is a very, in their data, there is a very faint, here is faint, here is a brighter Einstein ring. Um, so, just to summarize, another option to do is to do low resolution observations, spectroscopy. Look for something that has two, uh, that has uh, spectra that belong to two different galaxies, and then use high resolution, high resolution imaging to confirm that this is indeed a lens. Because what you can also have is two galaxies that are next to each other, that are projecting next to each other, but not close enough to do strong gravitational lensing. And uh, this has been done very efficiently by the SLACS collaboration. The Sloan Lens uh, ACS is a Hubble camera, I forgot the name, survey. So what they did, they used uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was, you might have heard of it, it was this massive survey of lots of galaxies going on for uh, almost 10 years. It was taking images in many different colors, but also spectra. And then they used Hubble telescope for higher resolution um, imaging. To explain how does Sloan, um, how did Sloan get the redshifts? Uh, so Sloan, here, here was their telescope and they, as a part of the survey, they targeted some galaxies that they knew would be in, the, in their field of view, and then made a mask. Mask It's basically what you can see here, a big sheet of, uh, of metal with lots of holes in it. Um, each hole is centered of, uh, on one of these galaxies, and they did two go spectra for each of the holes. So this allows you to get spectra for a lot of galaxies at the same time. Um, and each of these uh, holes has three arc second diameter and three arc second, that's pretty close to what we would expect for a typical Einstein radius. So what the SLAX team did was to take all of these spectra, actually notice, I think selected spectra towards um, elliptic galaxies and try to fit that, try to look at them, here's the amazing data quality and look for spectral lines that have, have to come from two different redshifts. And what you can see here, uh, you can't probably read this, but it says this is a continuum redshift. So they fit the continuum of the foreground galaxy at redshift 0.3 to 2. So this is that elliptical galaxy. Then on top of that, you have all these very bright emission lines, which, are, they actually, which actually come from another galaxy at redshift 0.58. So again, the, the size of the holes here was only three arc seconds. That means that if you have spectra from two galaxies, they are probably pretty close together, but you want to make sure they are a gravitational lens. Um, 
OK, that's just summarizing what I was saying. But this is the type of images that you would get with Sloan telescope. It's basically a blob of reddish light, because the, it's a small telescope. The thing isn't that great. So in the next step, they went to Hubble Space Telescope. And if you observe this, this same source with Hubble, you get something like this. So it's, it's having these two components, very good spectroscopy to find their two candidates, and high resolution um, um, AJST follow-up that really enables you to do, you to do it. And uh, OK, my number, numbers don't add up. So um, in an earlier version, I think they had 131 candidates follow-up with Hubble. Actually, they, end, they add up. And of these, 70 have been confirmed as lenses. So you know, with class, the VLA thing, you had to go over 16,000 objects to find 22 lenses. Now you went through, OK, the entire SDSS database, but what we found afterwards, 131 candidates, and 70 of them are lenses some of which you can see here. And these are all very different from the, from the strong lenses you would find with at radio wavelengths. These are all blue star forming galaxies. Um, some of them amazingly nice. So again, these are Hubble Space Telescope images, not slow on. Otherwise, you would be uh, seeing blobs all the time. So this was... Uh, Showing how we, yes? Wouldn't the low resolution affect this if the spectroscopy doesn't measure the objects? <laughs> um, yeah, yes. Um, so this is basically um, uh, the issue is if you have your hole in the, um, in the plate because your resolution is low, and uh, with a slow one telescope, it's a two meter telescope, so by the diffraction limit, it should have normally pretty good resolution, but the seeing is not necessarily good. So you can have a galaxy being out here that uh, contributes light into, the, into your fiber, but is actually not associated with the galaxy in the center. Yes, so there, there would be some contaminants. Um, what helps a bit that the diameter of these slits is three arc seconds, and the thing is typically lower than that. So this contamination isn't, isn't that bad. And uh, it shows up a bit in the statistics that from the 130 candidates, 70 have been lenses. So the contamination is low. Uh, where this might have a problem um, is what do you do with galaxies that have much wider separation of images than three arc seconds? Because this can happen, for example, with cluster lenses. And I didn't include the figure here, so you'll just need to believe me. That basically, if my image separation is too large, and I'm taking, because Sloan was targeting known elliptical galaxies with this survey, and I put my fiber over here, I won't see these two images at all. So this strategy is good at finding compact lenses, not so good at finding very wide lenses. And I mean, you can see from the Hubble Space Telescope, none of them is very wide separation. And basically, all of, the, all of the lensing here is done by single galaxies. You don't have lenses by, lensing by two or three galaxies, the group scale lenses or cluster lenses in this. You, will, you wouldn't find them. So I've talked about how to find lenses in the radio wavelengths and in the optical. And now we'll move to a completely different area of astronomy where I feel more confident. Um, so this is at far infrared and millimeter wavelengths. And um, let me just briefly walk you through this. So when you look at the galaxy that has star formation and enough dust in it, uh, its spectrum will look something like that, like this. So this is, uh, on the x-axis, we go from 0.1 uh, micron, which is close to optical. Well, that's optical. That's 100 uh, nanometers. So you go for optical near infrared around one micron. There are some features around 10 microns coming from um, carbohydrates. And then you have this big thing over here uh, between around 50 and 1,000 microns, which is coming from heated dust. So what happens in these dusty galaxies? You have young stars 
that radiate in the optical and, um, and UV wavelengths. But the dust absorbs light, that happens. But if the dust absorbs light, it warms up. And so what you see here is actually the emission coming from the dust heated by starlight. And it's bright, like on this curve, that, that can be a large part of your galaxy luminosity. So we have a lot of bright sources in far infrared and millimeter wavelengths because if you go to higher chip, this will move to the millimeter window. And then there is, okay, the video works surprisingly. Uh, and then there is this thing that I, I'll spend some time on. Uh, if it would start from zero, there would be. Okay, um, it's doing something here, but it froze my computer. Uh, okay, it might start running again. So, if you take this dust uh, spectrum over here, let's say I'm observing at this wavelength. Uh, at redshift zero. As I move to higher and higher redshift, but I keep observing in the same wavelength, I'm moving in a rest frame to shorter and shorter wavelength, wavelengths and up this bump. So my galaxy is getting further away. It's becoming, it would normally become fainter, but I'm also probing the parts of the spectrum when it's becoming brighter and brighter. And so this adds to this effect that when you take, let's say I'm observing at this wavelength, and I'm changing the direction of my galaxy I'm putting in, and you see at some point, so originally it drops rapidly, and then it almost stops changing. It's decreasing very, very slowly. Look at the wavelengths where I'm observing with my eye stick. And basically by redshift seven, it's almost, uh, it stops here and we do again. Okay, not good. So I'm observing at this wavelength, one millimeter. So first it drops very fast because the galaxy is moving away. But now I'm moving to the part where around redshift two, the intersect of the curve with my stick doesn't change anymore or changes only, only slowly up to ridiculously high redshift. And what this means is that these dusty galaxies with lots of star formation appear to be, to have the same brightness between redshift one point something up to redshift, up to, up to ridiculously high redshift. So if I would look at the sky in the millimeter wavelength and look at the brightest sources of it, they, they don't go down with redshift. So the, my bright source might be galaxy at redshift two or at redshift eight, they will, or at redshift six, they'll appear to have similar brightness. Unfortunately, far infrared wavelengths um, are not accessible from the ground. So the big breakthrough was done with the Herschel telescope uh, in far infrared wavelengths and millimeter wave telescopes such as the South Pole telescope. And uh, here we are using additional, so we have two effects. As you move further to higher redshifts, your galaxy brightness doesn't go down, what you measure. But what happens is that galaxies don't get, to for, for galaxies, there are chances of them forming, let's say, 1,000 solar, ma solar masses per year of stars is very low. So if you would look at the, at the number of, at the interesting brightness of these galaxies, it goes, sharply down. So you have a lot of dusty galaxies that are somewhat bright, but very, very bright dusty galaxies are very few of them. But if you have a lens with a magnification of two or five or 10 or 20, a galaxy from over here in flux 
will move up here. Galaxy from over here will move up here. Some galaxies from over here will be also magnified. So there is this very simple trick, which is you look at the, you do a wide field survey in far and further millimeter wavelengths. You look at the distribution of, uh, of the fluxes of your sources. Then you make a cut. And everything above that is likely to be lens or a nearby galaxy. And this is finding lenses in a, in a very unsophisticated way. We basically do a search at a wavelength where basically all the bright sources are strong gravitational lenses. And this has been done with Herschel at Farnford wavelengths. There is a South Pole telescope that is doing a very wide area survey, uh, which is also getting a lot of gravitational lenses. So I'll just, sh okay, you can't see it here, but um, this is one of the first, um, so this is an image from the, Her uh, from the Herschel survey called H Atlas, and SDP stands for Science Demonstration Phase. And so they did this map. Uh, you can't see much here, but if I zoomed in, you would see a lot of small dots here. Each of them is a galaxy. And then if the screen was better, you would see there are a few points that stand out, like few bright, bright spots. And these are all gravitational lenses. There are also some other bright spots which are nearby AGNs, but you can filter them out because we, we can match them with a the source. But the sources didn't know about and suddenly pop up brightly um, in your map are gravitational lenses. And indeed, here is SDP-81 that we have seen before. It's even more dramatic with the South Pole Telescope because South Pole Telescope is doing these very wide area surveys at uh, very long wavelengths and basically can't see any galaxy unless it's super bright which often means lens. So if you look at this map, you see some very bright spots here. You see a lot of structure here that's cosmic microwave background and galactic dust. I think this uh, color scale mostly dust. And then you see like these few very bright spots. Bam, lenses. So what this has done for us, these surveys with Herschel and South Pole Telescope, is we have hundreds of, pot of lensing candidates, and even some of them were found in using the Planck satellite. Planck satellite was not supposed to do gravitational lenses. It's measuring the cosmic microwave background, you might have seen the nice map and galactic dust, but also so there are a few lenses that are so bright you can find them in Planck data. The problem here, and even you remember the exercise from day two, where you calculated the resolution of Herschel, it was, I think, six or 10 arc seconds. It's really bad at these wavelengths. And the problem is when you have your lambda over D term, these telescopes are small, like Herschel is 3.5 meters, South Pole Telescope is 10 meters, but your wavelength is to, can be a few millimeters. And your angular separation of the lenses is, is on the order of one arc second. So what do you need to do after you have all these candidates is to go for to high resolution uh, for higher resolution imaging, typically with sub a bit early ALMA cycles or sublimiter array in Hawaii, which is what people did. So these are images from H Atlas, a survey with Herschel, done now with sublimiter array. So the black stuff is optical light, uh, typically from CAG or Hubble Space Telescope, and the red contours are. Uh, millimeter wave um, emission. So you see there is like multiple images. This is a very tight Einstein ring. This is SDP-81 with a large ring, two images, one arc, second arc. There is some, you see here an arc in the optical with some bright component over here. But what you can also see, the problem with these lenses, um, Take SDP-81, you have Hubble Space Imaging over here, you see the lensing galaxy, but you don't see any emission at the position of the, of the red uh, contours. 
Actually, there is some super faint one, but the point is these dusty galaxies, because they have so much dust, they can almost complete, they can completely absor absorb all the starlight from them, which makes it tricky to do spectroscopic follow-up. This has been also done with SPT, so now it's uh, low-resolution ALMA data, beautiful Einstein rings over here, multiple images, um, nice Einstein ring over here, this is a nice lensing configuration. The, lens, the source galaxy here is at redshift 5.6. So we are picking up really high redshift lens galaxies. But again, for SPT lenses, there is no optical emission in this, plot, this point. So how do you do your spectroscopy to get to really confirm this is a, at a different lens, at the different redshift of the foreground lens? You do millimeter wave spectroscopy. So in millimeter waves, there are bright emission lines from carbon monoxide, or C+, plus, which come from uh, the gas in the galaxy. And this is a summary of spectra for the first part of the South Pole Telescope sample. Here we have spectrum for, for each galaxy. Here they didn't get any emission lines, but then you start picking up some bright, this is CO423 line, CO322 line. Um, this is CO524 line. Uh, this is a uh, carbon line, very faint in some galaxies. So you can get very robust redshifts for these sources as well. Um, and then you can follow them up with ALMA and you get this extremely high, high resolution uh, data when you go to high resolutions. But again, this is only because we knew where, we point, where to point ALMA. ALMA has a primary beam the size of the field of view is between 10 arc seconds and maybe 60 arc seconds, which can fit like one gravitational lens into it, and you really need to know where to point it. Good. So I talked, um, so I've been talking about how to select galaxies using spectroscopy, how to do that using millimeter waves, how to do this with, eight, uh, with radio uh, surveys. Uh, but this is, these are all special type of data sets. You, for radio, you need very bright AGNs. For millimeter wavelengths, you have these, you, you have these surveys now. Uh, but these galaxies are still pretty rare. There is only a few hundreds of them. And also here you are picking up very special galaxies that have a lot of dust in them. Uh, and then for the slags where we were doing the spectroscopy, you need spectroscopy for a ridiculous amount of galaxies to find your candidates. If you want to find some more normal galaxies being lensed, this is not going to work. Uh, this you need to, co to collect ridiculous amounts of data. So the main frontier at the moment is wide field photometric surveys with smaller telescopes. And just to decipher this wide field you mean, means you scan a massive area on the sky. And photometric means you say, I can't do spectroscopy, it's, it's too expensive, I need to put a fiber, I need to know where my galaxies are, I need to put a fiber into each position and measure the spectra. What is done in these surveys is they use broadband filters. So here is your ultraviolet filter, green light, red light, semi-infrared, more infrared. And you just take pictures of sky as big, at uh, low, low exposure times in all these colors and some of them even add more filters over here, and uh, hope that, uh, and build this big database of galaxies. This is not done to find gravitational lenses. No one would allow, like do this only to get gravitational lenses. But if you want to study galaxy populations at large, or even look for, or for example, look for transient for supernovas, what you need to do is to scan large areas uh, of the sky, and get a lot of color information, and this is what these surveys are designed for. So now I'll go briefly over three surveys that have been, that are ongoing, or have been going, or have just finished, and then I'll move to what the future is going to bring us. So the first survey uh, is actually the one um, with headquarters in Leiden, because uh, I need to do propaganda. Uh, so this is the kilo degree survey, or called KITS, using a 2.7 meter telescope at Paranal, in Chile. It's surveying a total area of sky of uh, 
1,500 degrees a square degrees. To put this into perspective, the total area of the sky is 40,000 degrees. So this is still a small patch of the sky, but they are going pretty deep in magnitudes. And uh, one thing that it makes it unique, uh, in a way, is that next to, also at Parana, is another telescope called Vista, that is doing parallel, uh, that is also imaging roughly the same area of the sky, but in near infrared. So this is done in optical, there's another imaging done in the near infrared. And to show you the quality of the data, here is what we had from the previous large survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that was also used in the Slack's campaign. This is an image from KIT uh, that I stole from their website. And okay, it looks like this is a bit messier than this, but that's actually the point. So here you see one, two, three very bright galaxies and like some fainter blobs. Here you still see one, two, three fainter galaxies, but now they have more structure. And you see all this additional stuff around here, which are fainter galaxies. I mean, here the contrast is better, but the point is we really want to find a lot of faint galaxies. Uh, another survey that finished a few weeks ago, I believe, is a dark energy survey uh, using the 4-meter Victor Blanco telescope in Chile. This is the telescope that uh, Pedro has posted next to his door. So this ran from 2013 and 2019 and is doing wider area than was done with the, um, with the kits. Okay, and we froze again. Um, so it's the wider area that was done with the kits, 15,000 square degrees, and has two interesting parts. It's overlapping with what has been done with Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so we will have more images for the same area of sky. But also, it's overlapping with the South Pole Telescope Survey, which I was showing before, where we found all these lenses. So we will have parallel information in millimeter waves and visible light as well. Uh, the Dark Energy Survey, um, because uh, the motivation for that is cosmology. Um, and I don't, j just to provide brief detail, uh, they are trying to measure the, a large number of galaxies and put them into rough redshifts, and also shapes of galaxies. So there will be two components of that. One big motivation is big lensing. But the really big motivation is the large-scale structure of the universe. So the galaxies are not randomly distributed through space, but they come in this so-called galaxy web where, because of gravity, they, they form onto the, on this dark matter over densities. And the typical scale, and this gives you, and from this you can, so basically the typical spacing here that I'm not an expert on uh, is related to the value of dark energy. So the point is, if you measure ridiculous amounts of galaxies and you know rough redshifts, which you get from the photometric filters, you might be able to start reconstructing this in large detail. But I'm not an expert on that, so don't, don't take, take me at my word. And then the last survey that is ongoing and is really interesting is Pond Stars, which is being done on Hawaii. Uh, it's using two smaller telescopes, two 1.8 meter telescopes, and they Originally wanted to add two more, not sure what's happening to that now. And sponsored by NASA and the United States Air Force. Uh, and this is because the main aim of this project is to look for near-Earth objects that might collide with the Earth at some point. So this is basically, we are trying to map all the asteroids that might be getting too close to the Earth. So it's doing something very different than the previous two surveys. The previous two surveys took 1,500 square degrees or 5,000 square degrees and went very deep on them. What is Pulsar is doing, it's mapping three quarters of the entire sky. It's basically everything you can see from Hawaii with very high frequency because they're looking for objects that might be moving through the sky as asteroids. Um, the downside here is that it has very low resolution. This is 1.8 meter telescope. Hmm. Okay, I'm freezing again. Uh, and I can't go backwards for some reason.
OK, sorry for jumping. Um, so this is a 4-meter telescope. So just by the size of the telescope, you'll have better resolution. With pan stars, this gets tricky. So resolving your gravitational lenses is a bit difficult. So what they've done is combine pan stars with Gaia. And this is work done by a uh, really uh, smart guy in Cambridge. So I've seen this map from the Gaia satellite that's measuring positions of stars to extremely high precision. But that means it's also measuring a position of a lot of other bright things together. This is a spa space satellite. And when you can combine the colors from pan stars with positions of, of uh, lights from Gaia, this turned out to be a very good way how to find lensed quasars, which are bright enough to be find, found in Gaia data. Uh, so this team, in two papers, discovered 46 lensed quasars using this technique. And here you see some, uh, some images. Um, but for many of these, um, so just to, so this is the galaxies that were found using pan stars and gap, which is a bit more evolved. But I'll freezing again. Uh, but I'll show you now two slides of what you might get typically as an output of this survey. Uh, OK. So this is uh, something I got from Alessandro Sonnefeld, who was teaching at this very uh, place last year in the part, as a part of the Astro Twin call. And he's involved in one of these surveys with uh, Hyper Supreme Cam on the Super Telescope. OK, so you have, OK. OK, I can't go back. OK, so you have these two slides. Um, uh, and this thing, unfortunately, stayed the same because I didn't copy it correctly. But basically, you see what you would see with a typical telescope uh, from these surveys when you combine all the colors together. So now you would go to your Kahoot. We'll play a game that all these people have to play. And we will try to find gravitational lenses in this. Um, I'll go to the slides again. So don't. Forget about this object for a second. It's in both slides. Um, but if you go to Kahoot, uh, next, next. Which of the two slides is the one with lenses? Uh, so you will have two minutes for this. And I'll keep on skipping the slides if that. Uh, and this thing belongs to the first slide. It shouldn't be in the second slide. So one of the two slides has some lenses in it. Um, or there are no lenses in any of the slides, or there is actually a lens. Uh, there are some lenses in both slides. Um, is it? OK. Well done. Um, so let me go back to the slides. So this tells you how difficult this exercise is. Um, so this is slide two. Let me go to slide one. So again, in the center of these slides are bright red galaxies. And what you want to look for is some kind of bluish features around them. So this one has an obvious blue thing. There is a very faint blue thing over here. B super faint blue thing over here. Blue thing over here. This one has probably the best obvious feature. This one has a blue thing over here. And I'll just stress, these things are not, as far as I know, lensed images. These are just some background galaxies. Oh, and um, so this is the same lens that I copied from the first slide. But these, so again, this is some very bright galaxy, yellowish, with some white fuzz around it. But it is actually part of the galaxy. 
here there would be a very, if I look from it from here, there is a single blue blob over here. Here there are two very different galaxies. So there is a very red galaxy over here, single blue galaxy over here. This is very mixed, and this is a single galaxy. That's the lens from the previous slide. But this is basically the type of data sets we have to work with. And, uh, uh, and this tells you how challenging this is. These are pretty large telescopes. They provide a lot of color, color information. Still, this is rather tricky. Uh, I'll just make an announcement about this. So Alessandro Sommerfeld was happy to provide us with some of the already analyzed data from one of these surveys. So if you want to try this yourself, um, I've, I'll be posting some data on the Google Drive. There is already a training data set with, I think, 10 lenses and 10 non-lenses. We have, I think, 80 more images that you can feel free to go through and classify. Um, just to, just to, if you want to have a more feeling for how this, uh, how this works. So this is the problem we have from this massive data set. We don't have spectra for these, uh, for these objects. If we had spectra, as we had in the slacks uh, uh, part, you could readily think, okay, this, and if you take a spectrum of this, you would see a single, um, no, this is a lens. But if you take a spectrum of this galaxy, it would be at one redshift to the same here. These are might be more difficult. Whereas in the slide one, if you would take a spectrum of this, you will see there are two different redshifts, two different redshifts, two different redshifts, two different redshifts. We don't have that for these surveys typically. Um, so we really need to rely on colors from the broadband from the wideband filters. We can try to do morphology. So if you trust yourself well enough, you can try to hope there are some really arcs or rings or multiple images. Uh, this has been a big frontier for machine learning. Uh, there have been many papers by Luis Petrillo in Groningen and many more. Um, and uh, just to put this into perspective, there is a, it, would, it would be nice if we could test them. And so there was this lens, fund, lens funding challenge done by, done by a team in Bologna. Unfortunately, it doesn't come with uh, that many pretty images. So I had to, the download of the images was like two terabytes, so I didn't do that. But this is some example of what kind of lenses they produce. Uh, so these are lenses, these are not lensed galaxies. There is something fishy going on here. And somehow in this, um, so what they do for this uh, challenge, they ran a really big simulation. They had source galaxies that had, they had lensing galaxies that they thought were realistic and they did, and they basically created fake lensed images. There's a lot of large rings happening around here, so which we don't really see in real life. So there is something interesting happening, but if anything, it makes finding lenses in these simulated data sets easier. And um, these are all the teams that uh, took part in this. I'll just say there were two different types of challenge. One was for ground-based telescopes. One was for space-based space -based, based telescopes. And so these are 24, 24 teams that took part in this challenge uh, using wide range of techniques. There is some deep machine learning, neural networks, um, some classifications. Some people were, I think, trying to look for arcs. Uh, and then there was this one team by uh, Neil Jackson and uh, Tagore and Manchester One who did everything like this. They went through all the images by hand. So they took 100,000 images. Uh, they had two people. Uh, they, they did it in two days. One person went over 30,000 images at the rate of 2,500 per hour. The other one is examined 70,000 images at the rate of 5,000 per hour. I don't, I don't know how you do that uh, physically, but okay. Um, 
And uh, the point is, I don't see the results here because they are difficult to visualize. They outperform many of the algorithms. The, the problem here is that as, a, as humans, we are very good at recognizing shapings. That's what all, the, uh, all of the uh, deep learning is trying to reproduce. If you have humans who are really fast and have a lot of scale, they can still outperform many algorithms. And indeed, even for a lot of these other teams, um, okay, for a lot of these other teams, they use the multi-stage approach they fir where they first used some algorithm to select potential enzyme candidates, but they still had to go for them visually for the final selection and they often rejected like 80 or 90 or more percent of what the algorithm found. This is still very, very tricky. Um, so here comes a very efficient way of finding lenses by using army of people. Um, because if you realize that if you can train humans, they might be able to find gravitational lenses in these low resolution, few color data. Uh, and they can, they can do better than expensive algorithms. Why not do that? So this was uh, exactly done. Um, OK, this ended up uh, in a different order than I wanted. So this was done by the, so you can use crowdsourcing to, to do this. Um, and there is a project called spacewarps.org, ORG. I'll show it on the next slide where they decided to feed people two different surveys, uh, two different surveys. First, the CFHTL survey. This is Canadian, French, Hawaii telescope lensing survey. Uh, and then later, and this was the main effort, a survey with the Japanese 8 meter Subaru telescope on Hawaii. They let people, they uh, had 37,000 participants, which is a massive amount of people, and they analyzed 11 million images in eight months. Like, none of these people were crazy enough to do a couple thousand images per hour, um, but together they basically analyzed 160 square degrees from here and 14,000, 1400 square degrees from here. Um, this is a website. Um, is the link? Uh, this is the website, it's hosted on the Zooniverse platform that, uses a lot of, that does a lot of citizen science projects. And so, so this is how the website looks like. Originally for this course, so when I was giving lectures on gravitationalizing before, this was still ongoing. So you could create an account and log in and try to find gravitational lenses. Unfortunately, now it's um, out of data. But if I would do, okay, I now need to look over there. Okay, so it comes with a handy uh, guide, and then it shows you basically image of some field where they think there might be a lens in a few different colors and with a few different imaging processing techniques, and this makes it easier for you to spot some um, to spot some uh, something that looks like a lens. Well, this is a blank field. Blank field, blank field. You know, you have to click for a lot of images. Um, and they will start reproducing again because they are, the website is no longer fully functional. Um, but this was a very successful project. And uh, again, the point is you train the users. So at the beginning, you would have to go through a few tutorials where they show you how does the lens look like what is not a lens, what are the potential contaminants, like ring galaxies. Um, and uh, they found lenses. They actually found quite a few of them. This is just uh, one page of few that could be filled. Um, and again, this is the type of images people had to work with, but here you see a super tiny Einstein ring, some multiple images over here. This is a group scale lens, something that would be completely missed in the slides because there we had three arc second radius. One lens over here, well, basically all of these are lenses, but you see some nice arcs. Uh, it looks better on my screen. 
Um, so again, this is the type of data set that I can provide to you if you want to try this for yourself. Unfortunately, it's no longer being done online. So what happens in the future? Uh, all of these surveys so far have been done with small telescopes by different teams, but there are some major efforts being underway that will produce a lot of lenses in 2020s and beyond. Um, first, I would just like to uh, explain how many lenses do we, are, are, do we expect to detect. So this is an old paper by Oguri and Marshall almost 10 years ago, but it's a good illustration. So what they did, they did some very simple simulations. And what you have here, this is for a survey that would cover 20,000 square degrees, half of the sky. And this is the, how deep your survey. So this is, your survey goes down to the 18th magnitude, 20th magnitude, 22 magni 20 second magnitude, and so on. And this tells you how many lensed quasars, this curves over here, do you expect? So if you go, if you have a survey of 20,000 square degrees, uh, and going down to maybe 23rd magnitude, you might expect a couple thousand lensed quasars. Whether that matches, whether that will match the actual performance, it's tricky, but I'll fi finish this lecture by talking about three surveys that will start imminently in 2020s. So one is the large synoptic survey telescope uh, being done in Chile. This is the artist's visualization. This is uh, a photo from the construction site, I think a few weeks ago. It's got, it's almost done. It will be finished in 2020. Now they are building the dome and the entire telescope and instrumentation is ready. It will be eight meter telescope, so we no longer have these low resolution images. It has the largest CCD ever made uh, with massive field of view, so it can observe lots of galaxies at a single time. It covers 18,000 square degrees, which is almost half of the sky. So, so this is comparable to the 20,000 degrees over here and will go really deep. So we expect tens of thousands of lenses. Um, here is the view of the camera. So here is the angular size of the moon. Here is the total field of view of almost 10 square degrees it will have. Um, the downside is that on the first, on the first, um, the main survey will not have spectroscopy. It will have many colors and higher angular resolution. So it's like the surveys we saw a few minutes ago, but better resolution and deeper. And the second thing is that a big motivation for this type of survey is transient events like supernova, meteorites, um, uh, and so on. So they decided to go for very short exposure time. They point the telescope somewhere in the sky and they take 15 second exposure. There is now some discussion about having a 30 second exposure. The problem with 15 second exposure is that you don't go deep enough for a lot of extragalactic science like strong lensing where we want to find something very faint that might not be found in 15 second exposure. And you have a lot of different ex short exposures, so you can stack them but their image quality degrades. And I'll show an example in a, in a second. There is an instrument that won't have to care about atmosphere at all, that's Euclid, built by the European Space Agency. Launch is scheduled for 2020, most likely. Again, the instrument is basically uh, built up, now it's more scheduling with the launching rockets. Um, it will do very deep fields over about uh, between a third and a half of the sky. It is amazing resolution, 0.2 arc seconds, although it has only one meter mirror, this is because it is in space. It will do very deep, deep fields, and crucially, it will also have spectroscopy available for a lot of galaxies. So you can do, again, something like SLACS, but from space, for m many more galaxies. Um, the difference with the LSST is that the LSST reduces its data the day after they are taken. With Euclid, we will have to wait about three years until the first data release occurs. And just to compare um, the image quality, this is from a recent paper by LSST where they are complaining about short exposures, basically. 
Uh, so this is the type of images that Euclid will provide. Uh, here are some bright, you can't see there very well, but there is some nice Einstein arc. There is the lens of the, there's the light of the lens in galaxy. When you subtract it, you see really this nice Einstein arc. This is LSST, if you would take a lot of 15 second exposures, stack them. There you have the problem that the weather changes from one exposure to another. The alignment is not necessarily perfect. We have like a big blob of, I don't know what, uh, red and green and blue. So with the LSST, we'll have to get a bit more smart and not stack blindly all the data, just stack the data with very good weather. So this would be the best weather possible. This is what we might reasonably expect from LSST. And you know, if you are super lucky, that's comparable to Euclid. If not, this gets, this gets tricky. And again, we won't have, at the beginning, at least spectroscopy for many of these things. There are just too many galaxies to follow up spectro spectroscopically. But this is, you know, two of these missions will start delivering data next year. And if you, go, if you go on to do your master's or PhD or become astronomer, you will have to deal with the flood of the data from here. A reminder from yesterday, this is what we got from Slacks, the 60 or 70 lenses. This is Slacks, this is what we will get from Euclid after two months, which is only 3% of the total mission. There is a lot of work to be done in de deciding how do we even find all these lenses. There is lots of teams working on this. And then after this, you can't follow all the lenses up. You need to select the, maybe the interesting ones, how you do it, what kind of science you want to do. That's, that might be very well something some of you uh, will end up working on. The fi final thing I would like to say is if you remember from the start of this lecture, we were talking about lenses that were detected using, as, using radio observations. Radio observations of uh, bright AGNs and then follow-up showed they are gravitational lenses. And class was a very nice example of how to do this. But all of this is done at optical wavelengths. And, uh, okay, let me do it this way. And basically, there are now so many lenses being detected in the optical wavelengths, that only 10% of all the known lenses were discovered at radio wavelengths or are radio bright. Uh, this might change with the square kilometer array telescope. Um, that you might heard of, it will be the, a massive radio interferometer. It comes in two, um, two designs. There is an Australia, we'll have a low frequency network which we don't care about. And in South Africa, we'll have higher frequencies which provide you higher resolution because lambda over D. And so this is the visualization, how it might be, how it might look like. The phase one is in a very advanced stages of design. Which it's supposed to, getting built, to be built in 2020s. Money is uh, going to be an issue. Because uh, there is a lot of money allocated, but it's unclear whether the full phase one design will be preserved. Um, so with the SKA emit, if you would reproduce the class strategy, the survey with the LSA, from only one square degree, you will have 400 lenses. The reason for this is because SKA will have so much more sensitivity than VLA did. You can go now for not only the brightest radio sources, but also much fainter radio sources, which increase in number. So the numbers of sources that can be part of strong lenses increases dramatically. If you do full, if you do full sky that you can see from SK location in South Africa, you'll get 100,000 lenses out of it. The problem we are, I would be, I'm worried about right now is that we won't have the resolution to do it. So this is a paper divided in 2015. Uh, where we looked at how will the SKA MIT uh, configuration, how will it image uh, some gravitational lenses. So this is B1938, a pretty compact one with Einstein ring. This is some multiple imaged quasar. And the problem is with the uh, SKA, with the VLA, 
to find these gravitational lenses directly with the SK. We want high enough resolution to resolve these images. This is the best we could do back then with a the design that still had very long baselines in it. So you barely resolve this radio ring. And if it gets much fainter, you basically lose it completely. Uh, this uh, lens did it slightly better, but again, um, it, if you decrease its luminosity, it's also get, going to get very tricky. So depending on what is going to be built from the SKA, this might be a very easy exercise. and We'll get hundreds of thousands of radio lenses, or it will get very, very hard. Um, I believe last week New, Ze New Zealand announced they are getting out of the project, so this is going to be interesting. And this is where I would like to finish for today. Uh, again, I'll just turn the light off for a second. So you can, okay, this helped only minorly, but there's a lot of bright points in this plot. Imagine this plot will get 30 times bigger by the end of 2030s. That's all the gravitational lenses we will have just from Euclid. It will be challenging. What happens to that depends on you as well. Um, thank you very much for attending this lecture. Um, we will meet at 2 p.m. for the exercises. And um, today, so I'll just announce what we are going to do. Uh, so the presentations will happen uh, tomorrow at the beginning of the exercises slot at 2 p.m. Uh, for convenience, you can send them to me by email, put them on Google Drive, bring them on USB stick, we will present from my computer. So we don't have to plug and unplug a lot of computers. Um, today, and also for the rest of the exercises tomorrow, I'll give you, uh, we will discuss the problems that we have been solving so far, but I would like to let you do something uh, with lens finding. Uh, which is we will, what I got is I got a catalog of data from the class survey. So basically we, we have observations of all these gravitational lenses. And um, in the first part of what the class team did, they took uh, a number of the 16,000 objects, did some follow-up observations, uh, and then used some steps to filter out sources that would be likely gravitational lenses. And they um, found a few hundred candidates to do that. Um, I think this is something that can be reproduced in class uh, with, uh, with Python or even Excel scripts. So we will try to do that, hopefully. Uh, we'll find something. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, see you later in the afternoon. Okay, so that was still a bit of your attention. Thank you for coming to the exercises this afternoon and for sitting for the classes. Um, this is the last day when I will give out exercise problems. Um, so from yesterday, we had the open discussion about the um, the deflection angle from the 1919 eclipse. My, as you might have seen on the Google Drive, I uploaded a table with my calculations. So please feel free to go through it and see uh, whether I have any mistake in it. And if not, you can compare it to your results and uh, the way how you do the calculation. Uh, from yesterday, we had three problems that I don't think we had much time to discuss, so please uh, ask me questions if, if you have any doubts, and I will try to post some solutions as well. Um, there was a part about microlensing, what happens when your lens moves in front of a source. Then we had uh, the six images from the Holy Cow sample. And uh, the simple question, and the task was to use these rough um, diagrams to try to pinpoint where the source is with respect to the diamond caustic. And uh, the last part was purely analytical and some sketching, which is we had a time delay function for a single isotherm atmosphere. And the question was where we will find the 
maxima, minima, and the saddle points. There is another exercise sheet for today, uh, which only has two exercises, but I would like one of them to run for um, for two days. Uh, so the first one is we've been talking today about all the different surveys we are using to find lenses and it would be good to have an estimate of how many lenses do are we actually expecting to find. So the, the question is to use this simple plot from uh, Auguri and Marshall where depending on the area of your survey and how deep your survey is, this curve gives you the number of the lens quasars. Um, the, I listed a few potential surveys that you could imagine could be done. Uh, PANSTARS, LSST, um, Subaru survey, and um, basically the task is to estimate how many lens quasars we will find. And then there is a rather long exercise um, about the class survey. Um, so today I was talking about how the class team used a long catalog of um, radio sources, selected some of these, did uh, result high resolution VLA observations of 16,000 galaxies, and I was trying to, out of these 16,000 candidates, go down to few that look like gravitational lenses. So, we will try to redo this part of the exercise where you go from 16,000 VLA observations to, uh, to the few lenses. And uh, basically what I provided for you on the Google Drive, uh, okay, I'll try to zoom this in. Uh, no, 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 no. On the Google Drive, you will find the file called class underscore table dot data, uh, which gives you uh, the list of all the components that were detected in uh, the class observation. So this ta table has a small header, but basically what it does for every, every source detected in the VLA observation, it provides the RA, the right ascension or the X coordinate declination, uh, the flux, and the size of this component in four rows. And so in the exercise, I summarized the four criteria that the class team used to reduce the sample to few lens candidates, uh, which is that there have, have to be mul multiple components, they can't be too large, uh, they, can't have, they have to have a certain flux ratio and they have to have certain, certain brightness. And uh, you can solve the, the exercise whichever way you want. Uh, I provided some sample uh, in Python, but I think you can use also spreadsheets uh, to do this exercise. Uh, but basically there are few tasks, two of them are bonus ones. One is just to apply this for one is to apply these four criteria to the sample in the table and select some of the lensing candidates. The second one is uh, to actually reproduce another extension that was done to the class data file, which is when they change their criteria to look for lenses with very wide uh, image separation. And the final task is for some of the galaxies you find interesting, you can make simple plots of the image configuration. Uh, as I said, uh, I provided two scripts on the Google Drive uh, to show you how to read in the table and how to uh, apply this criteria. You might need to tweak the script a bit. Uh, you can also convert it to any other uh, language you want. And I provided few, uh, just for clarity, few notes. Um, in case things are running too slow, just take first 2,000 rows in the table. They should contain some lenses. Uh, there will be some double counting of lenses if you use the script I provided, so we need to think about that. And uh, finally, there is a small note on the um, coordinate transformation. Um, for the practice of the, for the purpose of this exercise, 
uh, just take the coordinates as they are given in the table and don't apply any additional corrections to them. Uh, and this is the f final bonus problem that I will try to upload later today, uh, which is the lenses I was talking about, um, which were the two slides of lenses that we looked at uh, during the class. We have many more of these images. So for you to get a feeling, um, I'll upload, I already uploaded some training set onto the Google Drive. Uh, it should be in a HSC or Subaru Lenses folder. And then I will apply, put in some actual images for you to look at. If you have any questions, please let me know. Also, if you want to discuss any problems from the last um, three, four days. Uh, these are the last problems we'll be looking at. So for tomorrow, it's really the afternoon session. It's for the presentations, discussions, and answering any questions you might have about any of the problems we encountered. Um, yeah, please feel free. And of course, as usual, I, I know I don't say it um, enough. You can work by yourself, especially for the computing thing. You can also, I think working in teams might be a good idea. Um, whatever you feel more comfortable with. So, good luck. <laughs> uh, there was a derivation on day one that I promised I would post online, which is how many images will form for, an, for a single isothermal sphere lens. That's the derivation I was doing on this board. Now I uploaded a tech file with, uh, um, with all the steps. Uh, I also s tried to simplify it a bit uh, to show that th uh, there will be two regimes. One where we'll have only one image uh, if the source is far away from the lens. And that as you go closer than, um, than an Einstein radius to the center of the lens, you will have second image forming. Uh, the trick here, as in the class, was that uh, there will be, for one, of the solu for one of the cases, one of the solutions uh, for a second image will become inconsistent, so we need to drop it. So maybe we, in five minutes, I might start asking you some questions about the problems one and two, or if, you, if someone wants to come forward and talk already, please uh, feel free to do so. Um, I just would like to have some feedback from you on the problems. Uh, which, which of the exercises so far, which part of the exercises is giving you most trouble or is the least clear at the moment? Part two, like problem two. So the class survey. Has everyone done the problem one? Can I have some rough estimates of numbers? So this is not an exact exercise because you have to rely on this plot and read it by eye, but uh, for option number one, do we have a number of expected lenses? Option number two, 9,000, some other numbers? Any other numbers for that one? 6,000. I mean, it's 10,000 minus plus minus 5,000, that's good. The, the third option, which is LSST. Hmm? Sorry, 9,000. So we are getting more consistency on this one. 700. 1,400, other numbers? Just to, how I would do it by hand for, for example, the first survey. This is done for an area of 20,000 lenses. The limiting magnitude is 21.5. So indeed, we should be somewhere around 1,000 lenses. And you know, then you extrapolate. It's also good that the bigger the survey gets, the more lenses you find. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the numbers we expect. Um, I'll have some uh, disappointment for you, maybe. So we start having preliminary results from some of these surveys. Uh, I mean, the pan stars is ongoing, but uh, we already saw people found some um, quasars, about 50 of them. Uh, the Subaru data set, which has been largely analyzed so far, has so far zero. Qua lensed quasars in it, uh, which tells us that we probably don't, so first this is an old result, but not much has changed. It tells us that we probably don't understand completely the frequency of our sources, the masses of the galaxies that do lensing. There are some big discrepancies. Maybe with time, we will 
figure out how to find quasars in the, in the existing data sets and get up to these numbers. So far, it has been a bit of a disappointment when it comes to lensed quasars. I mean, Gaia, Pastars and Gaia got something. Subaru, the galaxies we have seen on the two slides I was flicking, and they will be in the data set on Google Drive. They found a lot of star forming galaxies that are being lensed. That's why you have Einstein rings, not point like images. But quasars, it has been pretty tough. Good. Um, for the second part, how is the, for the second exercise, very all able to use my code or at least get it running. So I get. So you, you are free to write your own thing if you want to save time or are unsure how to do it. I provided uh, two versions of a code on the Google Drive. One of them plots, one of them doesn't. Um, the thing there is that the code on the on Google Drive is using slightly different selection criteria, so you don't get the straight answer. Um, do we have some preliminary results for task one, which is how many lenses with two or three or four components you found? Okay. So that's, the, that's going f over the first uh, 2,000 uh, rows of the table, not the full. I think the full table is 26,000 rows or so. Okay, and five, and five and more. Do we have any? Okay. Okay. Do we have any other numbers for this or for the full problem set? If not, this is an exercise that's supposed to run until tomorrow. So, if there is a way how you can save your work, um, if you want to save your code uh, and you don't want to save it on the machines, you can also just upload it to our Google Drive. I'll make a folder for your codes. So you should be able to <coughs> upload into the class codes folder if you want to save your code. And tomorrow we can do these statistics again and see uh, what results we get. Again, this is not a completely deterministic. Um, it's not that there is one um, correct answer because the way how you deal with uh, some of the intricacies of the problem might change what you get out. Oh, 11,971. Any, do you have any of the more component? Okay. Uh, this seems, I'll say, this to me seems a bit high. Um, um, what you need to be, um, what you should check whether you are doing this is that you might be double counting your lands because the loop currently I'm not sure if you are doing the same way I did or not, but right now the loop runs over, over all the elements, so it takes each element and does the lens search, for example, for distance. So this would be your lens number one. And then it goes on to the next element and does the same search and, in, and tells you this is lens number two. So this might make you double count the, the number of lenses or the number of potential lenses, that's, there is a difference. Okay, uh, then we still have, I think, five or ten minutes to go, so please take your time. If you have any questions, um, let me know, and I'll be here, and then we will wrap up in ten minutes. And remember, tomorrow is the, as again, lecture at at 10 and then at 2 p.m. we will have the presentations. I'll just, um, uh, so I did a big short summary of the papers we, we have now announced. I think it's a very good combination. So there is about uh, finding a, a lens that has two Einstein ring from two different sources. There is one, so this was done with Subaru and uh, this was done, the second paper is on ALMA data sets of this uh, cosmic snake galaxy and uh, finding very small molecular clouds in it. There is one about um, dark matter substructure and satellite galaxies, which I will cover tomorrow. And the last one is on finding gravitational lenses. So we have a nice spread of topics. Uh, I'm very happy with that. So I'm really looking forward to your 
presentations tomorrow. Again, bring them on USB stick, e email them to me, upload them on Google Drive, whatever works for you.